I want to thank you all so much for your patience tonight. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties, and uh, you'd think after uh, how many years of, of virtual programming, we but they still happen. So uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Cheryl Pemberton. I'm with the Mid-Continent Public Library. I just have a couple things that uh, to say, and I'm going to turn it over to Angie. I am going to put a link to a survey in the chat. I'll put it at the beginning of the program and the end of the program, if you could take a, a few minutes to um, fill that out. And uh, I just want to remind you that, in case you don't know, we have another Buzzworthy Books online scheduled in November. And I will include a link to that registration in this in the chat at the beginning of the program. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Angie Strathman. Thank you so much for, for being with us tonight, Angie. All right. Thank you, Cheryl, for having me. Um, this is a quarterly program that we do. So you can go back um, and not only sign up for future ones, but also view the past ones on YouTube. Um, as Cheryl said, I'm the Reader Services Librarian. My name is Angie Strathman. And um, so the kind of goal and purpose of this program is to highlight some new books. Um, so these are all books that have been published within the last year, usually within the last few months. But rather than focus on the really big names, which I'm trying to highlight some books that maybe aren't on your radar. Uh, and so all of the books that I'm talking about today um, either have no holds list or um, a very short holds queue. Um, so hopefully I'm going to also going to be highlighting all different kinds of genres, including nonfiction. So hopefully you'll find something that meets your needs in today's presentation. So the first book I'm going to talk about is Chain Gang All-Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. And this book, I had read the author's previous short story collection, Friday Black. And so when I picked this one up, I was expecting something very thought provoking and bold, um, maybe with a little bit of a darker edge to it. And that is definitely what I got with this one. Um, this one is takes place in a kind of near dystopian future. And the prison system has started a hard sports league. And what a hard sports league entails is it gives prisoners an option. They can join this league, and if they do so, they can get free after three years. But the catch is they are participating in these gladiatorial-style um, fights to the death. And so only one person has made it out alive after three years. Um, so your chances aren't so great. Uh, this one follows two main characters. Thurwar uh, is almost at her three-year high freedom, and it also follows her lover, Hurricane Stax, and she has almost as many wins under her belt, which means a pretty high body count as well. So in addition to the games that are televised, we also follow the kind of outside lives of these prisoners. Um, they form kind of a loose collective called a chain. And so we follow all of the different prisoners on their chain. We follow some of their competitors. And what's kind of interesting is we also get some outside perspectives too. And so we get the executives who run the league. We get some protesters who, are, um, who think this is a brutal practice. Um, and most fascinatingly enough, we also get um, the perspectives of a couple of the viewers, and that comes in the form of a husband and wife. And the wife is kind of new to this whole thing, and so we get to watch her evolution to like just kind of feeling it out and seeing what this is from an outsider's perspective to becoming just as invested as her husband. So it kind of explores the complicity that we have in like violent entertainment as well. Um, the other really great thing about this one is it has footnotes that documents actual real life prison practices and statistics and people. Um, so it shows this kind of dystopian future is not quite so far away. So this one is very powerful and very propulsive. Up next, we have Mrs. Plansky's Revenge by Spencer Quinn. And Spencer Quinn is probably best known for the Cozy Mysteries Chet and Bernie series, which features a talking dog. Um, this one is also a little bit lighthearted, but with a very human protagonist. Um, if you have enjoyed the recent de um, detective series, The Thursday Murder Club, the Deanna Rayborn book, Killers of a Certain Age, or maybe even the TV show, Only Murders in the Building, um, you've recognized there is kind of a trend in having elderly sleuths as protagonists. 
In this particular one, Mrs. Plansky is an ace tennis or is a tennis ace. Um, she's also made a fortune. She and her husband invented a uh, a knife that slices your bread and toasts it at the same time. So I'm waiting for that invention to show up. Um, but her she gets a message from what she thinks is her grandson, and she ends up waking up the next day and her entire bank account has been cleared out. And the authorities don't seem to be very good at capturing the thieves. And so she decides to take matters into her own hands. And so she also takes off to Romania, which is where her uh, money seemed to have ended up. And so this one is kind of a fun take. Um, we all know that it's a very real phenomenon that um, people get scammed out of their money this way. And so it is kind of fun to see this memorable heroine uh, doing something about it. This one is a little bit more of a cozy adventure than a cozy mystery because we do know the culprits pretty early on. Uh, we just have to watch Mrs. Plansky to see if she can catch them in the act. All right, um, so we're seeing a lot of older protagonists as sleuths, which I hope will lead to seeing a little bit more seasoned protagonists and romance too. Um, and we get that in Role Playing by Kathy Yardley. This one is about a um, woman who, who is 48 years old and she has an empty nest now and she started going into this online game. And she there she meets a 50 year old man named Aiden. And she doesn't realize that though. She thinks he's college aged and he thinks she's in her eighties. And so when the two finally meet in real life and figure out they are the same age, uh, then that's when the connection starts to form. So this one is a little bit of a slow burn romance. Um, what I liked about it is not just that we have older protagonists, we also have a, a twist on the grumpy sunshine trope, which usually it, it's a grumpy guy and a you know lighthearted woman. In this case, it's reversed. And I also really like the very kind of nerdy pop cultural references. And so we get you know insight into this gaming world. Um which is kind of in the vein of the feminist romances we see by Ellie Hazelwood, um, the wonderful novella Can't Escape Love by Alyssa Cole, or Conventionally Yours by Anna Annabeth Albert. Um, so again, this is just a romance with a slightly different take than you might be used to. Next up, we have Mr. Magic by Kirsten White. Uh, and this one follows... Mr. Magic was a children's TV show, uh, and it featured a magician and a group of children called the Circle of Friends. And one of the Circle of Friends goes missing, and so the TV show goes off the air. But with it, all actual traces of the show also are erased from existence, like no one can find any clips anymore. Um, but there's still rumors of it that abound on online message forums, forums. And so now it's 30 years later, and the cast is going to reunite for a podcast about the anniversary. And so as they're kind of discussing the, the show and what exactly happened, most of them are missing memories of it. Um, and so they meet up in a deserted place, which is always a great place to discover like the mysteries of one's childhood. Um, so this one is really fun and explores kind of the Mandela effect, which is... Um, the kind of the most famous example is like everyone remembers the Berenstain Bears with an A actually always have been the Berenstain Bears with an E. Um, when it, the reality is that's not the case. And so kind of opens the up the question, is this kind of a collection, collective delusion that has happened? Um, if you do expect really nice, tidy resolutions and answers, this might not be the book for you because it does ask you to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, in the story. Um, and there is an author's note that brings in kind of a very real inspiration um, that I can't mention because it would bring in a spoiler, but it adds some added depth to this kind of creepy mystery slash paranormal thriller. All right. Um, up next, we have Speech Team by Tim Murphy. And this is about a 40-year-old um, man who has kind of fond memories of the circle of friends who were a part of the speech team when he was growing up. 
Um, but then he hears about the suicide of one of his circle of friends. And in the suicide note, his friend references some hurtful comments that the speech team coach made. And that has him go back and reconsider like his history with this coach and his own personal experiences. So he tries to track down his fellow members of the speech team, and they're all going to go confront their former teacher. So this one is about the kind of very real and lasting legacy, like someone's when someone tells us who we are and how we kind of internalize that in sometimes hurtful and harmful ways. Um, it's being described as the big chill meets the breakfast club, and it is kind of about that reunion of a Gen X kind of group of people. But it also has a little bit more of a dash of trust exercise, or I have some questions for you by Rebecca Mackay, where it kind of brings in that um, reconsideration of an older authority figure in it too. Um, so that's maybe an example of a not so great teacher, um, but this nonfiction book is an example of some um, the realities of teachers worlds today. Um, so this is The Teachers by Alexandra Robbins. And in this book, she follows a year in the life. Uh, she particularly focuses on three different teachers who teach different age groups and different specialties over the course of one year. And so she talks about all the different challenges from being underpaid, to, um, to the students being over-tested um, and all the different challenges they face with administrators, with parents uh, and things like that. Um, but you're not only seeing the challenges, but you're also seeing those moments of light and inspiration too. When you see the sparks of the students when they finally make some kind of recognition or connection or um, change in, in knowledge or behavior or confidence. Um, so, this is a great book that explores um, just the societal impact that teachers have, but also the challenges that face they face and the kind of need for some changes uh, uh, in the world of teachers to make their jobs much easier so that we can continue to keep and retain talent there. All right, um, up next we have To Shape a Dragon's Breath by Not Monikil Black Goose. And this is um, takes place in a uh, deserted island of Monacog. And the English have colonized this area. And with it, many of the indigenous people, but also their rituals have been killed off. And that includes dragons that used to be an important part of their rituals. And so a young girl finds a dinosaur's egg, which is a rarity now, and she ends up bonding with the hatchling. And so she gets sent to a boarding school run by the English, and she has to attend it, otherwise her dragon will be killed. And so this is a fun fantasy book, um, but also a... Um, important fantasy book that it brings in kind of parallels to indigenous culture and history. Um, so obviously um, natives being sent to boarding schools is a huge part of Native American history. And this takes that to a different realm by sending a young girl to a dragon academy. Um, so it brings in that magic uh, aspect as well. All right. Um, moving from fantasy to space, uh, we have Some Desperate Glory by Emily Tesh. Uh, this is the first in a space opera series, science fiction series. And it is about a young girl named Kerr who grew up. Um, she is living on the Gaia outpost, and which is basically the last refuge of humanity. They have been taken over by um, the Majorca. And Kerr has grown up thinking that the Majorca are evil, and she has a very black and white binary view of her world and its history and its culture. And she has always um, seen herself growing up becoming a warrior, fighting against the Majorca. But instead, she is enlisted to, um, to the nursery, where she's expected to bear children instead. And so as she's starting to rethink her purpose, she is um, also getting to know a little bit more about the complexities of the world around her and the people in it. 
Um, so this is not just a uh, an arc with adventure and action, but it's also kind of a coming of age story of someone um, kind of a character arc of someone going from um, ignorance to a greater knowledge of her world and the world around her. All right, um, moving from space to thrillers, but this also has a science fiction component. We have My Murder by Katie Williams. And this one is kind of billed as a clone solving its own murder. And it is that, but it's also a little bit more complex and interesting than that too. So Lou is a woman who had been killed by a serial killer. And the Resurrection Society has um, resurrected her and four other of the victims of the serial killer um, after a public outcry. And so they all form this kind of support group um, as they trying to adjust to their new slash old lives. Um, so Lou has all of the memories of her, um, the woman who was killed, uh, but she didn't have those actual experiences. So she is trying to adjust to becoming a husband and a mother when she never actually met the spouse or um, gave birth to the children. Um, and she's missing the memories of her death. Uh, but she, as she and the others begin to talk, she's starting to realize that there might be more to it than this just serial killer um, and her, her demise. So this takes place in a very interesting near future world with lots of fascinating elements. It raises all sorts of questions about what happens to trauma when you can't remember, um, about the role of being a mother and a, a wife, um, about our society's fascination with true crime, and then again, a lot about identity. Um, so uh, again, like a clone solving his own murder is kind of the tagline, but you actually get something just a little bit more evolved than that. And I should mention as I go along, if you have any questions at any time, um, feel free to pop them in the chat and Cheryl um, will let me know. And then also um, she has passed along a list of all the titles that I'm talking about too. Cheryl, I saw you unmuted. Have there been any questions? Not yet. Okay, thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. You don't have to wait until the end. All right. Um, so the last book kind of had elements of our fascination with true crime. And this is a non-take, non-fiction take that kind of does the same thing. So We Were Once a Family by Roxana Asgarian follows the true story of two women who in 2018, they were the adoptive, adoptive mothers of six black children. And in 2018, they um crashed their car over a cliff on the Pacific Coast Highway in a murder-suicide. Um, but rather than focus on these two women and what their motivations might be, um, this journalist goes back and looks at the children and the families that they came from, the or their families of origin where they came from, and uses it as an exploration of, of the foster care system in particular. Um, so this is a true crime book that centers the victims rather than the killers. Uh, or in, the, in this case. Um, and so it looks back at the families where these children came from, um, how sometimes the agencies focus on um, removing people from families than rather than like the government focusing on um, actually addressing the challenges that families face um, in some cases. And then once the children have been placed, not necessarily following up on their welfare um, after the fact, because there were allegations of abuse and neglect um, from these mothers before um, they actually drove the car off the cliff. Um, so this is for fans of like really nonfiction dealing with important social issues like the author Matthew Desmond, or if you read the fiction book Demon Copperhead, which follows a fictional character and his journey through the foster care, care system, you might appreciate this one as well. All right, um, so we're going from the serious to a little bit more lighthearted here with Charming by Jade Linwood. Um, this is a fantasy and so, you know, we all enjoy those Disney fairy tales where 
Prince Charming um, comes to the rescue of a damsel in distress. But is that same Prince Charming the one that shows up in every single fairy tale? Well, this book imagines that it is. And when Snow White and Rapunzel and Sleeping Beauty all get together and start to swap stories, uh, they realize that their supposed hero um, actually had some flaws. Uh, because after the rescue, he takes off with their money. So he's a, a scammer in this version of the fairy tales. Um, but these damsels are not just waiting to be rescued this time around. They're going to take matters in their own hands, and they are out for revenge. So this one is a fun twist on fairy tales. Uh, it's been described as having the tone of the princess br bride or Shrek. Um, I can also see it appealing to those who enjoy the fantasy novels of Alex E. Harrow. Um, Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher is a much darker version of the uh, Prince Charming Gone Bad story. Um, so you might um, like a lighter take of that book with this novel as well. All right. Um, next, we have another love story, New Adult by Timothy Janowski. And this is the third book in Janowski's Boy Meets Boy series, um, although they all can stand alone. They feature completely separate characters and storylines, but they all feature young men in their early 20s and their search to kind of find themselves and to find love. In this particular version, Nolan is a struggling stand-up comedian, and he is trying to... Um, make headways in his career, but he's also in love with his best friend, Drew, and uh, isn't quite ready to act on that either. Um, he finally does, though, by inviting him to his sister's wedding, but a last minute career opportunity comes up and he ends up um, standing Drew up. So he immediately has regrets and wishes on a, a magic crystals that were in the wedding um, bag. And he wants his life to skip ahead to the good part, what he thinks is going to be the good part. And so he wakes up seven years later, and he has a successful career as a comedian. But the consequences of that are his friends and family are no longer in his life. And so in order to rectify that, uh, he has to go back and find Drew. But Drew isn't quite let, ready to let the betrayal stay in the past. So if you like um, romances with a little bit of a fun fantasy or time slip twist, like the movie 13 Going on 30 or Casey McListon's One Last Stop, um, you might like this one. All right, next we have um, Evergreen by Naomi Hirahari, Hirahara. This is the second book in her Japantown mystery series, um, but this takes place in a different setting and a different conundrum. So you can definitely read this as a standalone. Um, but if you want to go back to her first book, Clark and Division, it will give you some more background on our main character, um, Aki Ito's story. So this takes place um, shortly after World War II, uh, after the Japanese have left the internment camps. Um, so Aki has resettled back in Los Angeles, but it's a very different Los Angeles than she left behind. Um, they're in new homes, they have new careers. She and her husband has just come back from the war and she's settling into what married life might be. Her husband's best friend um, enters the picture and she suspects him of elder abuse and then once he goes missing, um, she thinks he might be involved in something even larger and more dangerous um, connected with violence in the Japanese community. So we do get a mystery um, that Aki is trying to solve in connection to what's happening in her community. Um, but this will equally appeal to fans of historical fiction um, because it's a very richly detailed and um, fascinating story about the process of resettlement after internment for Japanese Americans. Great. For a slightly more action-packed um, adventurous mystery, we have A Line in the Sand by Kevin Powers. This one follows um, a man named Marmon who uh, is going for his daily swim when he finds a dead body on the beach. 
And Armand is a maintenance worker at a hotel, and he is there after having served in Iraq as a translator. And after his family has been killed in an assassination attempt, he um, gets to move back, move to the United States um, for his own safety. And he's had some trouble adjusting to life. And when this body shows up, he doesn't think it's random. He thinks it's connected to his past in the war. There is a detective that shows up and um, she also has her own um, past connections to the Iraq war. And um, there, the trail of this murder leads to a journalist who is investigating a company that is seeking a government contract. Um, so we go from a mystery to kind of a thriller, a kind of political conspiracy thriller aspect um, as it goes along. But in addition to that, though, too, it does have a very introspective aspect when it explores kind of the um, ramifications of war on various characters. Kevin Power's previous book won the Penn Faulkner Award. Um, he is a former service member himself, and so he brings that authenticity to the story as well. All right. Um, and next up, we have... Perilous Times by Thomas D. Lee. And this is kind of a fun twist on Arthurian legend. It imagines that whenever the British realm is in peril, the Knights of the Round Table are reincarnated. Um, and this time, what's facing the British realm is not um, a war, but the effects of climate change. And so we get Kay coming out of retirement, and we also get Lancelot, um, and they are both kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum. Kay is teaming up with a team of um, environmentalist um, activists, while Lancelot is kind of siding with the powers that be. Um, so we come to realize that in order to save the British realm, one side is focused on preserving power and one side is preserving a livable earth and those two sides aren't necessarily uh, in agreement with each other, which might sound familiar. What I really liked about this book is that it kind of takes the theme of heroes and does it in an interesting way. Um, so people in this story are kind of waiting for the heroes to, sh um, to show up and make change when in reality, you know, sometimes we need to be the agents of change ourselves um, and not wait for someone else to come uh, and save us. And so it's got a really like fun twist on characters that we recognize from Arthurian legend and kind of takes it to a modern day setting and dilemma. All right, um, next we have Hula um, and Hawaii is very much in the news right now with all of the wildfires. And one of the things, in addition to the many lives that are lost, one of the casualties of the wildfires was um, the destruction of part of the Lahaina Historical District, um, which was the home of the um, Kingdom of Hawaii for many years. And so this is another book that kind of explores the indigenous Hawaiian culture and community. And it does that by following a young girl who is entering a hula competition. And in the course of um, entering that competition, she starts to learn more about the background, not just of her community, but also of her family and some of her mother's closely guarded secrets. Uh, so again, this is just a, um, it uses the story of one individual and one family to explore a larger story of Hawaiian culture um, and history. Okay, um, so next we have Mastering the Art of French Murder by Colleen Cambridge. And if you recognize the title, um, it is an homage to Julia Child's famous cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. This is the first book uh, in the Americans in Paris series, uh, and it follows Tabitha, who is a friend of Julia Child, who is taking cooking lessons from her. She's an expat in Paris. Um, so when a dead body is found in the cellar and Julia's knife is actually the murder weapon, Tabitha takes it upon herself to investigate. 
So this is one that features kind of some insights into post-war expat Paris life, um, but you also get the delicious concoctions and the delightful personality of Julia Child as a secondary character as well. Okay, moving on to nonfiction, we have In the Country of the Blind by Andrew Leland. Um, this is a memoir that also deals with a larger kind of cultural history of blindness. Um, Leland, as a teenager, is um, diagnosed with a condition that means he will gradually, over the course of either years or decades, go completely blind. And so as he's beginning this journey, he starts to explore what that might look like for him personally, but also to look at the varied and rich experiences um, and the history and culture of, um, of the blind. And so he explores the language, he explores the technology, um, explores some of even the politics um, behind blind culture. Uh, but throughout it all, he's a very witty and warm guide through it all. Um, it's a very kind of affecting memoir where he explores um, not only what he's losing, but also the things that he's gaining as he learns more about this world and how both his sense of self and his relationships with others change. Um, so again, it's both a very personal story, but also a larger story about the disability experience. All right, um, and so moving on, um, one of the fun things about kind of paying attention to new books is seeing sometimes books that seem that they belong together. And so um, now I'm gonna explore a few different um, pairs of books um, that kind of explore similar themes for you to pick and choose which one's most interesting to you or possibly potentially pairing them together. So up first, we have a take on Frankenstein. Um, Her Last Words by Stephanie Marie Thornton is actually historical fiction that follows both the author of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, and her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, a famous feminist who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. And so through these two women's stories, um, we get to see kind of the challenges that women faced during that time period. And the fiction book, Our Hideous Progeny by C.E. McGill, it follows the niece of Victor Frankenstein, uh, a fictional niece of Victor Frankenstein, who is a famous paleontologist, but has troubles making inroads in her career as a woman. She doesn't really know anything about her famous uncle, Victor Frankenstein, except that he disappeared. But when she finds his papers, she thinks she's going to recreate his famous experiment with a possible interesting twist um, in order to gain recognition. Um, so again, this is uh, just two different takes on both the author of Frankenstein and a potential legacy of the character. Um, our next theme is the golden age of Hollywood. Um, and so you can explore that in two different ways in these two books. First, we have Lindsay Lynch's Do Tell, which is historical fiction that um, takes a former minor movie star turned gossip column columnist and looks at it to explore um, all the different ins and outs of studio era, studio era Hollywood. And if you like the lighter side of that aspect, maybe in Enemies to Lovers rom-com, you might like the um, romance novel, It Happened One Fight by Maureen Lee Lenke. All right, our next theme is women out for revenge, uh, wronged women out for revenge. Um, so the first book is not a how-to book. <laughs> it is a fiction account, How to Kill Men and Get Away With It by Katie Brent. Um, and in this one, it's kind of a setup like the movie Promising Young Woman, where a woman um, who has been wronged um, finds a way to... Um, make good on the other men who have done harm to women. Uh, it's also kind of similar to my sister, the serial killer in that kind of darkly comedic tone. And on a slightly different, more relationship and character driven twist, we have Goodbye Earl by Lisa Cross Smith. And this is about a band of women who kind of um, support each other when one of them is wronged and um, the ways that they get revenge. And yes, it is inspired by the song, Goodbye Earl by the Chicks. 
Um, our next theme are magical circuses. So if you loved the night circus and are looking to go back into that world of, of magic and circus and adventure, um, there are two different takes. Uh, if you like your uh, setting in Victorian England with a Faustian bargain in the mix, you might like the Carnival of Curiosities by Amy Gibbs. If you prefer an alternate 1920s setting with a time to travel and future element, then you might want to pick up The First Bright Thing by J.R. Dawson. And lastly, these are two recent books about librarians that both do have quite a bit of holds list, but I couldn't help but uh, include them on this slide because they're about librarians, uh, but two very, very different kinds of librarians. And how can I help you by Lara Sims? Um, we have a former nurse turned librarian who's very interested in helping people in a very unconventional way. But a new reference librarian shows up. Um, she starts to, and a patron is found dead. Um, the new reference librarian starts to suspect uh, her colleague uh, is hiding some potentially dangerous secrets. And so this is kind of a cat and mouse kind of game between these two librarians uh, and trying to figure out each of their pasts. In a very different librarian tale, we have The Librarianist by Patrick DeWitt, which follows an elderly retired um, librarian who starts to volunteer at a elderly um, care center. And that leads him to tell stories about his own past, um, one about his early marriage and friendship with a kind of a wily um, gentleman named Ethan. Um, and we also get uh, a story of when he was a child and he ran away from home for six days and met these elderly comic actresses, uh, which provided a bunch of comic relief to this book. Um, so the whole book as a whole is about how someone can leave a mostly quiet life uh, that can still be full of purpose and adventure in its own right. And it's got really elegant and kind of humorous, dry humor um, writing to it too. All right, um, so those are books that are out right now, um, but I also wanted to give you a taste of some books that are coming out soon that you might want to enjoy. Um, up first is the one I'm in, currently in the middle of reading, um, Starter Villain by John Scalzi, which is out on September 19th. And this one is science fiction. Uh, it concerns a man who inherits his uncle's supervillain business, complete with a volcanic lair. Uh, you notice the cat on the cover. That's because this book has um, sentient spying cats. It also has some very foul-mouthed dolphins on a strike and lots of other wild and funny um, aspects to it as well. So I'm having a lot of fun with this one. I recently finished Why We Love Baseball by Joe Posnanski. And Joe Posnanski is a former Kansas City Star sports columnist. And this book chronicles 50 of the most important and funny and poignant moments in baseball history. And we get the kind of expected moments and people like Babe Ruth and Sandy Koufax, but we also get some people who are mostly, unforgettable, mostly forgettable players who had one unforgettable moment. Sometimes it might be in the minor leagues or in Japan or um, you know, something other than like the major events we might um, remember. And what I like about this is we also get perspectives of people who are part of it, whether they were um, fans who were watching in the stands or an imposing player or a coach. And so um, as they are detailing their remembrances of these events, they don't always match up with the historical record, which kind of adds to the mythical quality of each of those moments. And then up next for me, what I'm really excited about is The Bee Sting by Paul Murray. Um, and this one was recently shortlisted for the Booker Prize. I loved Paul Murray's previous book, Skippy Dies, which was both very funny and very touching. And this one promises to be the same. Um, it follows a family who is, their business is going under and they're starting to explore what the ramifications are and maybe what the causes were as well. Um, but again, doing so with a lot of humor and with a lot of heart um, as well. 
And then the last three, a little bit further out that I'm excited about. Um, first up, we have the historical horror novel, The Reformatory by Tanana Reeve Du. Um, this one <clears throat> takes place uh, in the Jim Crow South and it follows a 12 year old boy who is sent to a reformatory school and the boy can see ghosts. Uh, and this book has a legacy of um, the boys from the past, he's seeing those ghosts. So if you love Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead, um, which was a diff very different kind of take on the Dozier School for Boys, this is a more genre take on that same um, horrific historical event. And then coming October 10th is the second book in the Andy Mills series by Love A.C. Rosen. Uh, I really love the first book, Lavender House. Um, this is a series that takes place in the queer community of 1950s San Francisco. And the second book um, follows a former Navy um, colleague of the detective and who goes missing. And then lastly, some of my favorite things in pop culture in the past couple of years were surprisingly comedy specials. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the nonfiction book, Comedy Book by Jesse David Fox, which traces kind of the history and culture of stand-up comedy. Um, Fox is the comedy critic for Vulture and also hosts the Good Ones podcast. And so I'm really um, interested to hear his take on the evolution of comedy. So those are just a few of the books that are either out now for you to enjoy or coming soon for you to anticipate. Um, and that's kind of the last of the books I have to share with you. Does anyone have any questions or maybe any books that you're excited about and want to share? Yeah, if you have any questions, you, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm going to throw my survey link in there just uh, if you'd like to complete a survey on the program. And I don't I do want to remind everyone of um, Angie's next program on November 16th. You can uh, register for that one Yeah, right now. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Um, are these also available as eBooks? Yes, um, many of them are, um, not all of them. Um, Cheryl um, has um, the list, the BiblioCommons list. Did you send that out via email, Cheryl, or are you putting yeah, it in the chat? No, okay. I, I sent it out this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah. And so um, if you click on those titles, you can see what other formats they are available in, or um, you can feel free to um, check them out on Libby. Um, so yes, most of them are available in multiple formats, but I can't guarantee every single one of them are. Thanks so much. Love the reviews. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I'm curious, like, what genres do you all normally read? Like, is there, I try to include a mix, a little bit of something for everyone, but. Another nice thank you. Yeah, we have we have time for questions. If you if you have questions or you want to share share your favorite genre, hey, it's cozy mysteries and romances. We're looking forward to. Mm -hmm. um, um, so another romance out around it right now that I really loved was Business or Pleasure by Rachel Lynn Solomon. Um, that one's a bit on the steamy side, but it brings in some kind of real world aspects to all mm -hmm. as well. Ah, you always have something for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice variety. Oh. Oh, what makes a mystery cozy? Um, so cozy mysteries are generally mysteries where kind of the, the violence happens off stage. And so they're not kind of as dark as a lot of your other mysteries. Um, a lot of times they'll take place in like a um, a rural or a small town setting. A lot of times they'll have kind of quirky characters. So think kind of like Murder, She Wrote, the TV show is kind of a good example of what a cozy mystery 
um, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good example a little bit. Yeah, for sure. A lot of times I'll have details of like a, a, um, a profession or a hobby. So like the Julia Child one brings in like this culinary, culinary details. There'll be ones that might focus in like knitting or um, antiquing or things like that too. And there's also usually cats <laughs> <laughs> and puns on the cover in the title. Okay, now. <laughs> oh, I like that. Food without the mysteries of food without the calories. <laughs> I've seen them with recipes also. Yes, many of them do. I've never actually made a recipe I found <laughs> in a cozy mystery, but I'm sure they're really good. I hear if you go see Joanne Fluke speak, who's a cozy mystery writer, she brings chocolate chip cookies. So the Story <laughs> Center really needs to get on that. <laughs> And again, thank you for enduring the technical difficulties at the beginning. <clears throat> okay, um, well, I think we might be at the end of our questions for the evening. Uh, is there uh, anything else you'd like to add, Angie, before we, we close it for the evening? Or we look forward to seeing you in, in November. Yeah, you can see me in November. Um, also, if you're not tired of hearing me talk about books, um, I lead the stay at home book group with a virtual book group where we talk about what we're reading. Um, so you can look that up in our event system. And it's a good way to hear from other people about what they're reading and find out new things to add to your list. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, the stay at home book group is, book group is great. Great. Glad, glad to see you enjoy it. Um, and I think our next one is coming up Monday. So that's very soon. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, I think we'll go ahead and call it an evening. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you at future programs. Good night, everyone. Great. Thank you everyone for your attention. <laughs>